The German Experience by Tolzman, copywritten, 2000. He's an award-winning writer and curator of the German-American collection and director of the German-American Studies program at the University of Cincinnati. Tolzman. German-American Studies at UC Bearcats. <laughs> so... In the 1850s, main charges against Germans were there were too many free thinkers and rationalists and atheists and desecrators of the Puritan Sabbath in the German American community. Um, other newspapers complained about lager beer loafers who were transforming something something into never something that it had never been before in response to what they perceived as a desecration of the Sabbath. Nativists formed the Know Nothing political movement of the 1850s. On several occasions, German-American picnics and festivities were turned into bloody riots in places like Columbus, Cincinnati, and Louisville. There were riots even in Columbus. Columbus, Cincinnati, and Louisville. 1855 was the exact year that both Cincinnati and Louisville were attacking. The Anglos were attacking the German Catholics and the Irish and the immigrants and the other people... Uh, European immigrants who were in this country, um, and they didn't like them because, you know, they were taking our jobs, and they spoke a different language, and um, they they had uh, picnics and parties during Sunday. They enjoyed their day off. Um, so, you know, mm, in response to what they perceived as a desecration of the Sabbath, nativists formed the Know Nothing political movement of the 1850s. On several occasions, German-American picnics and festivities were turned into bloody riots in places like Columbus, Cincinnati, and Louisville. Many of the 48ers came under attack as they were viewed and described as free thinkers and radicals. Their societies were often denounced as alien and threatening to the republic because of their different ideas and perspectives. The Boston pilot claimed that it would be well if the know-nothings could prevent Germans from ever obtaining any kind of political power or representation. Other know-nothings concentrated not only on the 48ers, but also on Catholics and whom they viewed as a threat to Protestantism. Many violently anti-Catholic publications were issued at the time. So the Anglos, the original English, Anglo, Puritan, Americans, were publishing uh, uh, encouraging violence, you know, that's not Christian, they, they don't understand Christian, Christianity, their Puritanism was more for domination and control, not for doing what Jesus actually wanted to be done, to be taking care of one another and making sure that we're alive, they're advocating violence, Jesus was a pacifist, turn the other cheek, love your neighbor, so... The fake Christian know-nothings, who sound very similar to me as the Ku Klux Klan. These seem like the precursors to the Ku Klux Klan. Um, if they thought that Germans weren't white enough, you know, then anybody with any type of uh, color, brown, uh, black, uh, in their skin probably were discriminated against also. Um... Yeah, so their societies were often denounced as alien threatening to the Republic because of their different ideas and perspectives. The Boston pilot claimed that it would be well if the know-nothings could prevent Germans from ever obtaining any kind of political power. In 1855, the know-nothings won victories in Kentucky, Tennessee, Louisiana, and in 1856, they obtained 874,000 votes in the presidential election. So the German immigrants were a growing political force in America. Um... They began to appear in Congress, and they won the governorship of Massachusetts. In 1855, they were governors and legislatures in seven states with elected officials who were know-nothings. Also, not, oh, my bad, this is uh, the know-nothings. The know-nothings. So, not the German forces, but the know-nothings were getting influence, so the haters of the Germans were getting an influence. Also, it was estimated that 75 to 100 members of Congress were openly and secretly attached to the know-nothing movement. 75 to 100, so that's nearly a quarter. As German-American halls, festivities, picnics, and churches came under criticism and attack, many societies formed militias in self-defense. So, uh, 1855 was when the Anglos attacked the Germans. And so the Germans, in response, they're not going to just accept any type of violence just to be put on their families, their wife and children. So they started to form militias for self-defense. 
similar to the Black Panther Party uh, uh, for self-defense. So, black, uh, uh, many societies for militias and self-defense, a well-known clash uh, took place in Covington, Covington, Kentucky. In the spring of 1856, the Cincinnati Turners held a picnic across the Ohio River in Covington, and they were followed by a gang of street youths who began to shout and throw rocks and stones at the Turners. So the Cincinnati Turners, I guess, are the Germans, and the, these kids are the nativists. Finally, one of the rowdies grabbed a glass of beer from a Turner, which earned him a slap in the face. The youth then drew a pistol and ran back to Covington, claiming that the Dutch were out to kill him. Unaware that the commotion of the commotion being caused in town, the Turners prepared to make their way back to Cincinnati at 5 in the afternoon, conspicuously accompanied by a marching band and displaying the stars and stripes. Outside Covington, the Turners were met by a group who threw stones at them. One of the group members seized the Turner, who of course immediately resisted. Others came to the aid of the Turner, and soon a full-scale fight was underway, complete with rock, stones, and pistol shots flying in all directions. Two marshals received bullet wounds, and the Turners effected a retreat to a ferry on the banks of the Ohio River, where they panned across to the Cincinnati side. In the meantime, fire alarm bells in Covington had summoned an anti-Turner mob. Fire alarm bells in Covington summoned an anti-Turner mob, so they're organizing against the Germans, the German Turners. The German Turners lined up before the wharf and replied with a volley of pistol shots. The Covington mayor asked U.S. troops to attack the Germans, but the commanding officer refused to comply, as he could act only under direct orders from Washington, D.C. Meanwhile, the disciplined Turners held their ranks and firmly stood their ground, calmly obeying the orders of their commander. The police strove to quell the disturbance, and the mayor of Covington and nearby Newport demanded that the Turners turn over their weapons to the civil authorities. The mob shouted that they would not desist until this was done. At the time, the ferry arrived, uh, but the Covington mayor would not let the Turners board it. To the renewed demand to turn over the weapons, the commander of the Turners replied that he had no objection to this if it could do be done under safe conditions, but that in the face of a mob, arms were required for self-defense. If an individual was considered to have broken the law, no resistance would be offered to legal arrest. Four Turners were arrested. However, this did not satisfy the mob, which demanded further action. Local officials were now unable to control the mob, so the, the Turners decided that since they could not take the ferry, they would retreat to the Turner Hall located in nearby, nearby Newport. Judge Johann B. Stallo from Cincinnati, uh, who was also a 30-year, arrived at the point and informed the authorities that as long as they could not control the mob, the Turners would not disarm themselves but would remain in the Turner Hall and place themselves under the deposition of the courts in the morning. 31 Turners would be indicted and released on 2,000 bail each. The total sum of 62,000 was paid by two German-American businessmen. The court trial dragged on, but due to the able defense of Judge Stallo, all were eventually acquitted. The class itself reflected the cultural class between Anglo and German Americans. Nativism and along with it the Know Nothing movement would fade away in the face of the approaching national crisis that culminated in the Civil War. Indeed, the last meeting of the movement's National Council was in 1857, and it lingered on shortly after at the state and local levels. The growing national crisis together with the increasing political clout of German Americans eventually led to the downfall of the Know Nothings as German Americans came to be viewed as essential uh, to victory in the election of 1860. German Americans were pivotal to electing Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest presidents uh, America's ever had, and one of the greatest citizens that's ever came out of Kentucky. So Abraham Lincoln was elected because of German Americans. Um, just a few, few more bit on this. Uh, politics before 1850, German Americans were mainly aligned with the Democratic Party as they identified with the traditions of Jacksonian democracy and were also opposed to the anti-immigrant tendencies of the Whigs. Although German Americans would begin to make their major national political impact after 1850, they had already made their presence known in the pre-1850 period. The first German American political leader of national prominence was Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg the first Speaker of the House. He was followed by a number of other German-Americans in Congress in the early 1800s. There's a Muhlenberg County, so I wonder, in Kentucky, I wonder if the Muhlenberg County is named after uh, the family of Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. So they played an important role in the 18th century and continued to do so until the 19th century. By the 1830s, Henry Augustus Muhlenberg, son of uh, Gotthilf Muhlenberg, a brother of Frederick Augustus, had risen to national prominence in the political sphere. So, 
Muhlenberg was one of the first uh, political folks in there uh, in office. I don't know if I'll mention anything about Goebel. Mm. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had a high regard for Christian Schultz, uh, whose wife founded kindergarten in America. Um, in the election of 1860, German Americans crisscrossed the country for Lincoln. Schertz wrote, uh, Christian Schertz wrote that a large part of his job was to speak in German, and that it took him, and this took him into Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and elsewhere. Moreover, his speeches, as well as those of other German American community leaders, were well widely published in the press and printed separately as pamphlets for further distribution. Altogether, Schertz was said to have covered 25,000 miles on the campaign trail. Whenever he went, huge crowds met him, and when he traveled down the Ohio River, he received he was received by audiences of several hundred. All the extent, although the extent of German American influence in the election has been a question of historical debate for some time, there is no question that German Americans definitely influenced the election in Lincoln's favor. Carl Whitkey notes that the debate on the decisiveness of the German-American vote will continue, but all agree that it was without question important. <clears throat> Before the First World War Before the First World War, the lifestyle as Germans settled in America, they came to perceive and contrast their lifestyles with that of the Yankees or the Anglo-Americans. So Germans are not Yankees. <laughs> the Yankees are the Anglo-Americans. So Germans are in a class all to themselves. They noted that there were a number of differences and they, that they clearly intended to maintain their own family values and lifestyle. Although a very large and diverse group, German Americans displayed an ethno-cultural lifestyle based on their values, which was uniquely German American and came to distinguish them as an ethnic group. German Americans criticized that they felt was the egalitarian nature of the non-German family, especially in terms of the relationship between children and parents. This they contrasted with the traditional German family, which was clearly patriarchal. They also criticized that uh, what they considered to be the social reform crusade tendency of Anglo women and the deference according, accorded them. It appeared that these women had little to do but cultivate their extensive leisure time or spend it in trying to reform society in terms of Anglo values. By way of contrast, in the German family, the father was the head of the household, and the children and other members of the family were not on an equal footing with the father. In American families, women and children did not seem to work together as a family unit, but in German families, children and women worked together with men for the benefit of the family as a whole whether on the farm or in business and industry. German-American families tended to be larger than non-German families. Often families in rural areas would have four or more children, all of whom would work together as they grew up. Second, German-Americans tended to marry within their own immediate community and then reside in the region in which they had been raised. It is common that several generations of a family live together or in close proximity. The Gripshevers all stayed together in Sanford Town in 1869 when they moved here. The Gripshevers stuck together. They were loyal to one another, um, though one of them did become a barn burner, and then another one was uh, put into a mental institution. I guess two of them were actually put into a mental institution, um, Kate Gripshover and uh, my aunt. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, also, German-Americans... No. Home ownership was high among them. Third children tended to begin work at an early age and were assigned tasks they could perform on behalf of the family. Also, German Americans were not necessarily opposed to child labor within the framework of the family and the local community. Fourth, women were more often to be found on the home front in German American families as they worked as an integral part of a family business, shop, or farm. Here, the family was viewed as an economic unit, and each member had an important role to fulfill in contributing to the financial success of the family. Social activities for women usually found in the family and in women's groups of the German societies or churches, as contrasted with Anglo women who formed women's organizations, which it appeared were devoted to Anglo Reform Crusade movements, such as Prohibition. So the Anglos were anti Prohibition. German Americans believed that such groups wanted to impose their values and lifestyle on others, and they were opposed to such proselytism, proselytizing. 
um, prescription. They were against uh, being prescribed. Nobody's to tell a German American how to live their life. No Anglo Yankee will tell a German American how to live their life. So, German American, the German American experience by uh, Don Heinrich Tolzman.